changes in the mass started coming then. I made no particular note of the addition of the name of St. Joseph to the Communicantes prayer that happened in 1962, or maybe in 61. But I did know that it happened. I remember because I took the missile that I had and I wrote in the name St. Joseph in the Communicantes prayer because they said that, gee, after all these years, we forgot St. Joseph. And we ought to put St. Joseph in the canon. I learned from Brother Francis later on that Father Feeney, who was very specially devoted to St. Joseph, was not happy about that and refused to do it himself when he said Mass. Now, I began to suspect something truly amiss when the prayers after Mass were discarded. You know, the, the, the prayer to St. Michael and the prayer that includes the name of St. Joseph. <laughs> These people who had put Joseph in the canon had taken him out at the end of Mass. You know? Then word reached those of us who were wanderer readers that a new vernacular Mass was being constructed, including a change even in the words of consecration. But we also learned that a small book was available entitled Questioning the Validity of the All English Canon by Patrick Henry Omler. How many of you have any recollection of that? Just very few. Well, Patrick Henry Omler did a really good job on that stuff. And he, he pointed out that the change from for you and for many to for you and for all was totally illegitimate. And obviously, he was correct about that. Soon there were reprints of Quo Primum, the papal bull that's been mentioned before, the papal bull of, of uh, Pius V. Uh, Pius V did not construct what has been called the Tridentine Mass. I think everybody knows that. And in fact, the Tridentine Mass, there's no such thing as the Mass of Trent, which is where the word Tridentine comes from. The Mass that we love, the Mass that was said this morning by, by Father uh, Cormier, uh, Poirier, uh, goes back to ancient times. It goes back to St. Gregory the Great into the fourth century. It doesn't go all the way back to the time of Christ, however. We know that because if you look in the Mass, you'll see lists of saints that you mention as you go to St. Lawrence. I mean, <laughs> this is three or four hundred years after Christ, so obviously the Mass as we know it today wasn't constructed in the time of Christ. It somewhat evolved, and I don't like to use that word, but I think it's proper in this sense. So Quo Primum is the papal bull of Pius V, and what had happened is, is at the time that he issued it, the church was still suffering from heavy losses in the priesthood as a result of the Great Plague. Now, who were the first people who went to somebody who had caught the plague and tried to help them? The priests. And therefore, the, the amount of... of victims of the plague amongst the priesthood was huge. So many of them contracted it and so on. So replenishing the clergy had been accompanied by the entry of liturgical abuses, most of which were relatively innocent, though none were inconsequential, and none were deliberate destructively, uh, deliberate intents to, intentions to destruct. So the Pope issued this extremely strongly worded directive in 1570. And it is not an infallible pronouncement, uh, but it does carry the highest weight of the Pope's disciplinary authority. And what he said was, here's the Mass, this is the way it has to be done, and nobody can deviate from it, nobody can add to it, nobody can take out of it, you've got to do it this way, da -da 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 -da, in perpetuity. And he ended up by saying, he used a whole bunch of very strong words, he said, no one whatsoever is permitted to alter this letter or heedlessly dare co contrary to this notice of our permission, statute, ordination, command, precept, grant, indult, declaration, will, decree, and prohibition. Right? Should anyone, however, presume to commit such an act, he should know that he would incur the indignation of Almighty God and the blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Now, 